welcome back to the Crimson 15 podcast. I'm your host, Crimson Sin, and we got another Shira video for you. This one's a little bit different. It's going to be of the book that was released probably about a week ago. It's from Scholastic. There will be a link in the description below to the Amazon where you can get it. It's like four bucks, and it's okay. It gives us some uh, some backstory before episodes one and two about Catcher in the Door, just a little, little bit, but then it falls into basically a novelization of those two episodes, and that's where it falters. Everything that's brand new is kind of cool and i really like it and they even have this funny little like uh breakdown of the characters and then you know it's just like uh, the classic stuff you know who shira is who her door is but there was a funny little blurb from the catcher one and it's kind of anti-shipping here i'm sure a lot of people's heads are going to explode but i thought it was pretty funny i'm gonna go ahead and just read it right here cash and her door were both orphans and were close growing up in the horde they thought of themselves as sisters uh sisters 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 um I don't know if Katra saw it that way or how canon this book is or this description, but uh, I think Katra saw it more than that. Adora probably saw them as sisters. Katra was a little too clingy, a little too, I don't know, flirty. <laughs> sisters don't, you know, you shouldn't flirt that way. That's really weird. But um, I thought that was interesting. And they have one for Shadow Reaver, uh, Glimmer, all the other characters, but they're, they're pretty bland. But, um, the, the book opens up and they have these little illustrations at the beginning of each chapter. And I actually rather like this scene. It's uh, it's mundane. It has nothing to really do with the story, but it's just kind of a nice little scene. We have Catcher and Adora and they're going through, I guess there's like a little pile of like junk and destroyed type materials that the whore got rid of. But I guess there's a bunch of little stones. And since the intense heat of the forge, it shapes them. So they're like collecting them. You know, something young girls would actually do. And they're just kind of having fun doing it. They end up getting caught by Shadow Weaver. He's like, well, he's like, why are you wasting time doing this kind of stuff? And I like how their, their answers are like, oh, aren't, they, aren't these stones pretty? Aren't they they're nice to look at? Adora got back to searching the rock pile for treasures. The two girls have discovered the rubble stash when they were little. Even though they were teenagers now, they still came back. The stones were bright spots of color in the fright zone, a sprawling compound of cold metal buildings, spiraling black towers, all bathed in a dark, smoky haze of pollution from the factories. Topping it off was a constant low, mechanical hum that never stopped. The rock pile was a haven, a place all their own. Of course, it was hard to keep anything secret from Shadow Reaver. What are you doing, wasting your time in this pile of trash? She would ask the girls. It's not trash, Catcher had argued. Odora had backed her up. The rocks are pretty. They proudly showed their smooth stones shaped like clouds, beetles, and sprockets. Shadow Reaver had laughed. They're nothing more than chunks of silica altered by the heat of the weapon foundry, she said. But she hadn't stopped them from going there. I, I found that interesting that even though it was like a big waste of time, but Shadow Weaver still allowed them to do it. Like she didn't forbade them from doing it. And I think that's probably a lot to do with if it was just Catra, yeah, she would have freaking cut it off and say, hey, you're never allowed to go here. But since Adora was doing it, it was a lot of that... Adora came to the rescue, and if Adora said it was okay, then it's okay for Catcher too. So I, that little moment, them just looking for rocks and just being teenage girls and just trying to find something besides training and fighting, you know, some, some normalcy, which I thought was really cool. I would have loved to see this scene in the actual show. But, you know, that, that's just one of the small moments that I really liked in this book. As the chapters go on, it starts running into the actual episodes and that's where it kind of falls off. But there are a couple more uh, interesting spots and I'm going to just kind of pick out the ones that I like. We have a scene where Catra and Adora are going to, uh, I guess they had classes and stuff too. And they kind of show, uh, they're, they're constantly putting down their recruits, always keeping them in fear. Like they have a whole class about Beast Island where if you mess up, you're going to be sent to Beast Island and they have a giant list of all the offenses that will get you sent there. And it just shows how how they kept their recruits under the thumb. They kept them controlled by fear. But, you know, they, they've heard these lessons over and over and over again. And that's where you kind of get where Catra is just not paying attention. She's just kind of doing what she wants to do. And it's just more of how aloof she was to the whole situation. All she they want to do is go out and fight. They don't want to learn anymore. Like, they're ready to go out there and prove themselves that they can be fighters and get rid of the evil princesses. There's a, there's a couple of moments where it's like when Adora was still, like, quote unquote a bad guy and how those evil princesses I can't wait to show them and destroy them it's just really funny to see the good guy we know she's going to end up being a good guy but in this moment she's still just a bad guy I thought that was really fun we even get a nice little scene between Adora and her team her crew so you have Lonnie Lizard Guy Catra Kyle and Adora and this is straight from the book here Adora smiled 
She felt pretty lucky to be assigned to this team. Everybody had their strengths and weaknesses, but they all worked together pretty well. She was glad to call them not only teammates, but friends. It always showed that Adora, even when she was the bad guy, valued uh, friendships. She valued teamwork, even though it's kind of like, all, you know, everyone for themselves in the Horde. She still cared about every single one of her members. So we don't really see that in the show. She only looks like she only really cared about Katra. It would be nice for them to interact and like, you know, we worked together for all these years. We all grew up together, but she just kind of turned their backs on the rest of the crew. She only really cares about Catra in the show. I, I wish this, the, the feelings that she has would have been more expressed and better shown in the actual uh, episodes because she fights Kyle, Lon, Lonnie and all them. And she doesn't even care about them. Also in this first chapter, they did a really cool job of making the Horde soldiers and how uh, Adora looks up to them and how cool they are and how she inspires to be them. It's stuff that we didn't get in the show really at all, but here we go. Um, a squad of Horde soldiers marched past the group. They looked unstoppable in their head-to-toe gray armor. Helmets hid their faces with the panel of glowing light where their eyes should have been. I've heard they're liberating a place called Elberon today, Lonnie whispered. It's an outpost in Bright Moon. Adora shuddered at the words, Bright Moon. The capital of Ethereum was run by princesses, cruel rulers, who wanted to bring darkness and destruction to their planet. The Horde have been bravely fighting to take control of the kingdom for years now. I wish I was going, Catcher muttered. To see the world outside the fright zone for once? Me too, Adora agreed. I I, I like stuff like that. It, it, it gives you a little more uh, context to their characters where they want to become these soldiers. Because it kind of, in the show, it just, it's weird. They're recruits, then all of a sudden they're out there fighting battles and there was no uh, distinction between how they were and how they are now. Like, this kind of shows you, oh, the soldiers are different from these recruits. Lonnie, Kyle, Lizard Boy, they, they're, they're, not, they're not there yet. But all of a sudden, they just start fighting out and doing missions and stuff, but they didn't really progress any. They didn't get to this awe-inspiring, cool armor and everything. It's just, they, they did a so much better job describing it in the, describing it in the book. But, um, you know, that's just how it is when... When Noel Stevenson doesn't have her hands on the, the dialogue and the setup, it, it, it just turns out a lot better. It just does. So that closes out the first chapter, which is probably the best part of the book. We get to uh, Glimmer, and she's just an obnoxious brat for the most part. She's, she thinks she's self-righteous. I, I know she wants to go out there and fight and everything, but she just comes off as just like a brat, the, the bratty daughter of the queen. You know, the princess of, oh, my mom will get you in trouble kind of like attitude. She never says that, but it just feels like it. She got sent to some the, that Elberon that's going to get attacked, but I guess it's a way out of the way type little town, village, and they never got attacked before. So she's supposed to be there, and it was under the guise of her mom sent her there so it would be a safe place to guard. Oh, you're helping the rebellion, but she's really just putting her somewhere so she doesn't get hurt. And Glimmer kind of figures that out. She gets invited to like a recital a harp recital and this this chapter kind of sucks there but he's like who cares no one cares about that she ends up going like you know begrudgingly and they kind of trick her oh if we do get attacked we need someone strong there so oh, we get to have you you know kind of stroke her ego she actually literally falls asleep during this uh this recital and she wakes up when the village is under attack good job glimmer you did it glimmer sighed as she entered the hall she positioned herself by the doorway while the others took their seats as the harpist began playing a slow, joyless tune, Glimmer scanned the room for suspicious activity, but the only thing she caught was a small boy yawning. His yawn was contagious. She leaned back against the wall, her eyes fluttered. The music was so mellow that after a while she could hardly stay awake. Her eyes fluttered again. The horde is coming. So yeah, <laughs> she totally fell asleep. That that just that's so Glimmer. It's hilarious. But uh, so we get this fight scene going on, and then she's uh. She wants to run. Oh, we got to defend the, uh, the the town. But everyone's just like, oh, we're going to just retreat because we can't fight the Horde. And of course, Glimmer's upset about all that and everything. But I thought it was really cool that the scouts saw the Horde coming. So they're not at the village yet. And Glimmer's like, oh, we can cut them off at the towers. We can fight them there before they get to the village. Not a bad idea. But Glimmer has literally no fighting experience. She even admits it in the book that she's never actually fought a real battle. All she's ever done was like practice teleporting around her room and stuff like that. So it would have been nice for her to kind of suffer a defeat here so she can see, well, this isn't a game. My, you know, my mom won't let me fight, but she has good reasons for not letting me fight. It's, it's cool to see that there's actual little bit of an army here. 
stuff we never see in the show. We never see more than like seven bad guys at a time, but they actually go in a description like there's tanks and there's soldiers. Glowing sparkles jumped from her fingertips. She practiced using her sparkle powers before, but never in a real battle. There's a first time for everything, Glimmer thought, just as they emerged to the top of the tower and caught a glimpse of the approaching horde. Six gigantic spider-like robots led by two dozen troops. They weren't a huge army, but with their robots, armor, and laser weapons, they might as well have been 200. See, I like that. I like that the horde is bringing a force upon them. It's not just... Uh, we saw like in the season two where it's just Scorpia, Kyle, and them, and nothing. They didn't, bring, they didn't bring any damn soldiers. Here, we have two dozen soldiers and they have tanks. Exactly. They should be afraid. They only have like uh, bows and arrows and some of their magic weapons, like, you know, her sparkle powers and stuff. But that's nothing compared to, you know, laser cannons. I like that. The, the show needs more of that where the horde is this imposing force. It's like this indomitable Blitzkrieg type of tactics where they just roll over these towns and they have little to no defenses. That's why the mayor called for a full retreat. But Glimmer, you know, she left and she wants to fight them out in the woods which isn't a bad idea, but you're going to get yourself freaking killed. So the fight goes down. They're kind of getting their butts kicked. They're finding some weak spots. They're, they're kind of defeat the first wave of enemies, but there's another platoon of soldiers just as big as the last one, and they basically end up getting overrun. The mayor sends out one of their riders to save Glimmer to get her out of the battle. And she's like, no, I want to stay and fight. It's like, no, I made a promise to your mom. I'm not going to let you die out here. She starts to ride away, and she can see that the sentry towers, they get crushed. They get overrun. That, that's a cool scene where you have this uh, fighter. She want, This princess wants to go out there and defend her people, but she doesn't understand that you're getting yourself killed isn't going to help anybody. They didn't have the resources. They didn't have the manpower to defeat the horde at this time. It's better just to give up the outpost instead of just getting more people killed. And I like Glimmer's upset about it, but it's you're not coming about it from a smart perspective. You're coming at it from the perspective of a 15-year-old girl who doesn't know anything about war your, your father died in a war a lot of people are getting hurt doing reckless things will lead to uh, reckless results we get a kind of another fun scene that was only like alluded to i think it was in the 11th episode of season one where they're having their memories there was another h horde uh, female she looked kind of like a fish person her name was octavia and i guess katra and adora had another run-in with her besides that memory when they were little uh, Catcher just like put a snake in her bed because she's like scared of him or whatever. But they end up having kind of like a fight, like a like a little brawl in the barracks. And while it could be a really cool scene, some of the dialogue, uh, the setup for the fight, it's just worded funny. And it's really hard to write a fight scene it because you forget things and things quite don't make sense. And I had to reread this part like four or five times to like try to understand what was happening, but it just doesn't really make any sense to me. Oh, and it's also revealed here that Catra is the one who, like, took her eye. Yeah, that's not a prank. That's not a thing. You literally blinded her in one eye. I can see why Octavia hates you because that's pretty effed up. Like, she scratched out her eye because they start this little fight and everything. And um, right from the book, scratch her other eye out, Catra yelled one girl. Show her who's boss, Octavia, shouted one of Octavia's teammates. Catra yanked on Octavia's hair. Ow, Octavia shrieked. She grabbed Catra by the ankles and lifted her above her head. Body slam, body slam, body slam, the cadets began to chant. Catcher tried to kick out of the hold and almost succeeded, but Octavia's teammate joined the fight and pinned Catcher's arm behind her back. So she pinned her arms while she was above her head? She hadn't slammed her down yet. So that that, that whole sequence there, it just kind of, it's like a cool fight. I'm trying to follow it in my mind. But she says she lifted up above her head by her both her legs so I was going to do like a I don't like how you beat uh like a blanket <laughs> and just slam her to the ground but then whenever teammates grabs her arms while she still has her above her head it, it's just an it's just awkwardly written I, I wish that would have been cleaned up a little bit because that this is actually a pretty kind of fun fight the fight continues Adora glanced over at Lonnie Rognaldo again the lizard guy I can't say his name and Kyle they were cheering on the fight but nobody was moving to help Catra Dora couldn't stand by and let Octavia win an unfair fight, even if Catra had started it. I thought that was effed up. Uh, even uh, like Kyle, like he's like, yeah, I get her. Like, I, I maybe they're cheering for Catra, but once the it was a one-on-one -on -one fight, I don't know. I guess I'll let him fight it out. But one of Octavia's teammates joins the fight, so now it's two-on-one, -on and then they're gonna just let Catra get her butt kicked. I mean, that's messed up. Those aren't teammates. You don't let that happen. And of course. Adora sees it that way and she jumps into the fight and helps him. But yeah, boo on Lonnie and the rest of them. That's kind of jerky for them to do that. 
So with the door joining the fight, it's more of an even battle. And I guess it was who can pin who? I, I, I'm assuming this was uh, like there was rules to this fight. But um, for, right from the book, Catcher leapt. She landed on Octavia and pinned her down by the shoulders. One of the recruits dropped to their knees and tapped the floor with their hand. One, two, three. And the girl cried, Catra wins. Cheers and boos erupted in the barracks. Catra jumped up and pumped her fist in the air. Adora let go of Octavia's arms. So it was like a wrestling match or that <laughs> wasn't the WWE. I thought they were going to just fight till one of them, I don't know, got their butt kicked. I just thought that was strange that it was it was kind of like a wacky wrestling match. I don't know. I guess they had to end it in a kind of a kid-friendly way because if someone took my eye, I'm not going to be like, oh, you pinned me. I guess you win. But uh, yeah, of course it ends there and they're all happy because, you know, Adora saved her and they fought together and they're a good team. So Shadow River finds out about the fight and she goes down to the barracks and she's berating everyone like, you guys have that training exercise, that one we saw in the first episode where they fight the big spider bot. And she's like, why are you guys screwing around when there's actual real exercise going on tomorrow? Catra, this is, I love it because Shadow Reaver never buys any of Catra's crap. She's just like always so uh, flippant with her. Like she just dismisses everything she says. She just assumes everything is Catra says is a lie, which it often is. But uh, right from the book, I find it difficult to believe that you cadets are making noise when there is a training exercise tomorrow, Shadow Reaver said in their deep, spooky voice. The commander floated a few inches off the ground in the doorway of the barracks. As always, her black hair swirled above her head, a dark mask hit her face, and a flowing deep red robes covered her body. We were training for the exercise, Catra lied. If only I would believe you, Catra, Shadow Reaver said. Odora, couldn't you have stopped your fellow cadets from this nonsense? I just love that line because it's like, oh, Catra, yeah, yeah, lying sack of crap. <laughs> she just never, didn't even take into consideration that she could be telling the truth. I love that kind of stuff. But of course, uh, she will believe a door over everyone else and doors, you know, it's kind of expensive. Well, everyone's just super excited for the exercise and we're making being loud. And instead of just saying that they had a fight, Shadow Weaver kind of gives them a, hey, you guys don't calm down. And if I have to come back here again, then everyone's getting a spanking. No, everyone's going to get in trouble. So they kind of skirted the issue. And this is where we get some more of that. Um, Catra kind of, she doesn't hate a door. She hates the relationship that a door and Shadow Weaver have. That all oh, your teachers pet you. She always likes you better than me, and she'll let you get away with everything. And I can never do anything. She's always putting me down, which was true. So it kind of builds that weird. She cares for Adora, but she also hates her at the same time. The relationship between Catra, Adora, and Shadow Weaver had always been a complicated one. Catra couldn't remember anything from before she arrived in the fright zone. A tiny girl in a big place filled with people and noise and machines. The first friendly face she had seen was Adora's, a face of her own height with big blue eyes. Catra learned that Adora had come to the Fright Zone as a baby and Shadow Weaver had taken Adora under her wing. And when Adora had latched onto Catra, Shadow Weaver became Catra's mentor too. Maybe if I had been here before Adora, I'd be Shadow Weaver's favorite, Catra mused, not for the first time. She rolled onto her side and grabbed the end of her tail, something she did whenever she couldn't sleep. A spot near the end was always tender, left over from the time that the cadet team had dared each other to see who could get closest to the incinerator. After Catra burned her tail, the others had scattered. But Adora held Catra's hand all the way back to the barracks and then snuck into the infirmary to get supplies to treat the burn. Adora always sucks up the Shadow Reaver, Catra thought. But she's been nice to me when nobody else was. What would I do without her? Catra drifted off to sleep, listening to Adora's breaths beneath her. I, I like the these extra little moments uh, where thoughts, where her feelings. That's a cool little, uh, for her, she's conflicted. Adora's my friend. She cares about me. Uh, I... We were family, but at the same time, I despise her because everything she does is perfect and right, and Shadow Reaver always gives her the benefit of the doubt and literally will never give me that. I'm always hiding something. I'm always wrong. I'm always uh, the one not to be trusted. So I like that. I wish that was more in the show, but we kind of see it a little bit. But that's kind of where this book stops being um, interesting because it goes straight into the first two episodes. So we get the exact same dialogue the exact same scenes. So that pretty much covers everything I found interesting in the book that I found was uh, added to the story, added to the overall feelings of the characters. Um, not worth the money, even though it was like $3. So um, if anyone else read out there and read it and you saw some things that you liked, you know, share it in the comments below. There's a preview for the next book. And it's funny how this first one takes place a little bit before episodes one and two and it ends right at episode two. 
Then they skip all the way through season one, and the next book starts out right after the Battle of Bright Moon. And we get a little bit of a, I guess, Adora was flying around with Swift Wind. Swift Wind is just as uh, ridiculously stupid as he always is. It's that weird kind of, I want to free all the horses. But there is one funny line from that, and I, I just have to read it because I thought it was hilarious. So this takes place right after they took down some spider bots or whatever, and then Adora's kind of, that's the whole scene where, oh, can I come to the princess? Uh, princess reunion the princess uh, summit thing and she's like no you can't uh, why don't you go hang out with some other horses and then <laughs> it starts right here as if I can't hang out with the princesses who can I hang out with Adora shrugged what about other horses Swiftwind snorted in case you haven't noticed I'm not like other horses I'm the only magical flying talking horse in bright moon regular horses just don't get me I've been trying to start a revolutionary movement to convince them to leave their masters and be free. But they are content to eat hay in their warm, cozy stables. He shook his head. They had crossed into a village, and they were passing a barn with a fenced-in field. A brown horse stood by the fence, munching on a hay bale. Swift wind stopped in front of her. Hear me, sister. Break free of your chains of servitude that bind you, and join me in this glorious freedom of revolution. Nay, the horse whined in reply. What did she say? Adora asked. She said it's Alfalfa Tuesday at the farm, and she's been looking forward to it all week, Swift Wind said. Such a shame. She's a puppet for her overlords. That's hilarious that this other horse is like, F you, commie. It's freaking Alfalfa Day. It's my favorite. <laughs> These other horses don't care what you have to say. They are happy where they're at. They don't want your stupid uh, horse revolution, which would actually lead to people dying because not, they need the horses for their the paw their fields and things and deliver supplies. So, Swift Wind, stop being an idiot. I thought it was just hilarious that that other horse was like, dude, I love my food. Don't screw this up for me. But um, that, that book comes out, I think, next month. And we'll see how that one works out. These are pretty cheap. Uh, I think the next one, again, is only like four or five bucks. Uh, pretty easy read. Uh, super quick. You don't... I was hoping to get more of that earlier stuff, which I, I just like getting into the characters' heads. And that's something that you get in books. You get that in comics. We get to read their thought bubbles. We don't actually get any of that in the show. And it really does help that I don't have any visuals. So I can just imagine how Swiftwind should look instead of how he actually looks in the show. But um, thanks for watching, guys. Uh, if you're enjoying the Shira videos, uh, leave your comments below what you liked, what you didn't like. Be sure to subscribe. Hit the bell for notifications so you don't miss any of my upcoming videos. And I'll catch you guys next time. Crimson Sane here. Thanks for watching the video. If you're enjoying the content, be sure to sub like share and hit the bell for notifications so you don't miss a single upload if you have any tips or story ideas hit us up on twitter at c15 podcast or better yet join our discord server link in the description below